teachers and pianists, colleagues and friends. Today we're going to talk about how to teach the Bach Convention in A minor, number 13. It sounds like this. If we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio in the suburbs of Chicago. This of course is a well-loved piece by students. Many of our students need to play Bach Inventions for an exam requirement or just because they really should play Bach Inventions. They are so helpful in learning how to play counterpoint, how to have clean technique and all those things that we work on in our Baroque music. I will say this is in the second group of inventions that I teach. The easiest I find are number one, C major, and number eight, F major. And then the second group that I teach is this one or the B flat major. And I do have other videos on both number one and number 14, C major and B flat major. So you can click right up there to find those. Now, I realized I had a lot of things to say about this particular piece, so I'm actually going to split this up into two videos rather than keep you here forever. I don't want to lose your attention span. So in this first video, I'm going to talk about ways to learn this, things to help your students with in those initial learning phases, as well as how to make it stylistically appropriate. And in the second video, I'm going to talk more about how to take it to the next level, to a really artistic level, and then how to help your student play this reliably under pressure, whether they have to memorize or play this for an exam or a recital. And I will say I have a student playing this on a recital in just over a week. So I am in the throes of preparing this with her and she's going to play it very, very well. So let's talk about some basics on how to learn this piece. There are many things that make this one a little bit easier than many other similar Baroque pieces at this level. First of all, it's in A minor, so the key signature is not a problem. We do have several accidentals, partly because we use the harmonic minor scale, including the G sharp, in order to go to the dominant. And there are several diminished chords and really nice harmonies in here. So there are accidentals and the measures are fairly long. So of course we need to read and play accurately and you need to help your students make sure they're using their accidentals all the way through the long measures but the key itself is not much of a problem. Similarly, we're in common time, 4-4 four, four time, with almost entirely eighth notes and sixteenth notes, so the rhythm is not much of a problem here either. We have this very motorhythmic 1-E and a 2-E and a 3-E and a 4-E and a throughout almost every measure, there's just a constant sixteenth note stream, so learning the rhythm is typically not a problem in this piece either. So what ends up being a problem in this is that students like to play it really fast. And I'm actually going to link a recording to Angela Hewitt playing this on her home piano during the pandemic. She recorded many uh, pieces by Bach just from her living room. And you'll notice she does not actually play this very fast. If you have heard Glenn Gould play this, he plays it at lightning speed. And because it is exciting in this minor key, very active and motorhythmic, many students default to wanting to play this very, very fast. I'm not sure that that's musically the best choice and I don't think it's the best choice for their performance because it can really run away from them. So setting an appropriate tempo is one of the best things you can do and helping your students practice at various tempos, so they're feeling a slow tempo and a medium tempo is something else we're going to work on. All right, so let's talk about the subject. Anytime we do a contrapuntal piece, such as an invention or a symphonia or a fugue, we want to start by really understanding what the main theme is. And I think we could all agree that the first main theme is this broken A minor chord ascending. That's the first part of it. Whether or not you want to include the remaining two beats, I think you should. I think that's the complete first subject. Now, I did hear a lecture about this piece once where the presenter argued that there is a secondary subject, and that would be in the right hand beginning in measure three. It's these descending broken chords with the ascending outlined chord like that. That also happens in the left hand in the second half of that bar. And what you 
notice, whether or not you think those are both subjects or not, what you notice is the way that Bach wrote this piece is that the subject material constantly overlaps right hand and left hand and right hand and left hand. So the right hand begins it. second part is the same thing. And then we get a little fragment of it. And then it does that a few more times to finish out that main section before the left hand starts us all over again in C major this time in the middle of measure six. And of course that's imitated in the right hand. So students definitely need to know the term imitation, which imitation is just when you do the same thing but in a different voice. This happens all the time in two voice inventions and fugues. You can also help them understand this as if you were thinking about an orchestra. So maybe the flute plays a motive or a melodic line and then the oboe imitates it. Or same thing, the cellos play it and then the violins imitate it. It's the same material, but in a different hand at the piano, a different voice, or a different instrument in the context of instrumental music with multiple instruments. So one of the main features of this piece is that constant imitation, which feels like the two voices are interrupting each other constantly. And that's a great way to, from the very beginning to get your student's imagination and expressive ideas started. If this were a conversation between them and one of their friends, or maybe it's a little bit more like an argument between them and their sibling, that they're constantly talking over each other and interrupting each other. And so that's a great way to kind of even frame this up and talk about what's happening in this piece. Now that said, the other notable feature about this subject, both of them, if you're thinking of both of those two ideas, is that it's really just a series of broken chords. We have A minor first inversion to start, and then E7. Same thing, A minor, E, back to A. Left hand does the same thing. A minor, second inversion, E7, A minor, E, right? And then of course we have that happening in different keys. If you look at measure three, it's a broken A minor chord, little turn around to the broken D minor chord. So hopefully your student at this point understands their basic one, four, and five chords in A minor, and hopefully they can identify broken triads in any inversion, as well as seventh chords, so that they understand that this piece is just a series of those broken chords. It also makes a line. So I want my students to understand vertically what's happening, as well as linearly how that line works. This is going to be even more important later on. We have several instances where the notes are just a little bit hard to learn, but if you recognize it as one big broken chord, then it's not nearly so difficult. The little episode at measure 14 starts with that fully diminished chord. I guess C sharp is on the bottom, but it starts on that B flat tumbling down which turns into A7, which then becomes D minor. It has this diminished, which leads you to C major. If you are capable of reducing this down to a series of broken chords to kind of show your student a section of this with that harmonic movement, it will really help their ears and help them understand. Certainly label some chords within their book. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be some serious college level analysis. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about helping them find the chords and hear them and be able to play accurately because they understand, oh, this all has to be a C-sharp fully diminished seventh chord. Other places where this happens that's very helpful is when you look at the left hand beginning right before measure nine. That starts with a C major triad, has the little turnaround. sharp leading you to the this. Right there at the end of measure 10. I've had students miss notes in there, but that's all C major. So if they're playing something that doesn't, that's not C, E, G, then they're not playing the right notes. So those are the places to look at 
what's happening harmonically. And if your student is repeatedly missing a note, playing something inaccurately, then mark what the chord is and help them figure out what they're doing wrong. Oh, they're adding an F into a C major chord. F does not belong in C major, so let's get that to the E or to the G, whatever the problem is. It's also helpful to note in this piece, right when you're doing that initial analysis of what's going on in the subject and how is this piece constructed, that there is a lot of syncopation. I love finding syncopated moments in Bach in particular, as well as all music, because it's really helpful to have our students understand that we think of syncopation as being a jazz style or something that's more contemporary to our current time, and frankly, that's just not true. The Baroque great masters were syncopating things all the time. So one way that you can draw your students' attention to syncopation is to play without it. If I take that right hand in measure three, and then I wait and put the F on the downbeat of four, and the E on the downbeat of five, that suddenly draws your attention. That would be the straight way of doing it. And instead, Bach highlights those interesting notes and ties them across the bar line, which creates syncopation. So much more fun that way, right? That's a much more interesting composition and it kind of plays the two hands against each other when the other hand is being straight while the opposite one is syncopated. So if you look at three and four and add the left hand to what I just played, I'm in the middle of three. That's right on the downbeat. Wait. Now the left hand is syncopated and I play right on beat three with my right hand. Obviously, you need to play that in rhythm. I was changing the, the rhythm in order to highlight those things. But it is really important for your students to understand where things are playing on and where they're playing off the beat. This brings me to articulation. I think in general in this piece, you can go with a pretty much default of the eighth notes are detached and the 16th notes are generally legato because it'd be very difficult to play these all detached. But when you have those syncopated notes, if you played it with the straight version like I demonstrated, those top notes would be legato into the second 16th note. So I would hold those over and you know, make them legato into the beginning of the next measure. So let me just show that again. Here's measure three. Slur this into the next note. lower down, if you look at measure 11 and 12, we have these, these uh, octaves that provide that syncopation in the middle of the measure. And I would again slur those into the subsequent 16th note right after them. So while you're doing all of that, you're learning hands together, you're encouraging your students to use really good, consistent fingering in the learning process, you're encouraging them to find the subjects, to hear how things are sequenced, to analyze what's happening, to mark their chord symbols in. That's all things that should happen within the first few weeks of study on this piece, to really firmly and accurately ingest it and be able to play it technically cleanly, both hands separate and then hands together. If you'd like to think more about what sequences are and how you might draw your students' attention to them and use them to play expressively, I do have a video about the C minor little prelude by Bach where I talk quite a bit about sequences. So again, click up there to find that and that will help you think about sequencing in Baroque music. All right, so those are all the basics of how I would begin this piece, how I would do some really initial analysis with my students and help them learn it. We're gonna, of course, want to encourage them to practice this at a slow tempo. We're also going to encourage them not to always start at the beginning, right? Because we have a total of 25 measures. The first ones are generally well played by our students because they, they open up their book and start at the beginning. So I would also mark some different sections. Maybe you could get about five or six sections in this piece where they can regularly start practicing at the beginning of those. I also would recommend backwards practice or back it up practice where they start with the last measure, 
and then they do the last two measures, then the last three measures, and work up the whole second page in my edition, or start at the bottom of the first page and work up to the beginning. Those are all practice techniques that will work for accuracy, reliability. You also need to put the metronome on in this piece to hold them at a slow tempo if you want them to practice slow so they're really playing with consistent fingering and listening to what's happening and doing some analysis. All right, so those are all our initial concerns. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel so that you catch next week's video where we're gonna talk about how to make this artistic and make it reliable under performance pressure. If you have any questions about what I already covered today, feel free to leave a comment. If you have other pieces you'd like me to cover, again, feel free to leave a comment, and I look forward to talking with you more about this next time.